Yeah, um, thanks to all the contributors uh, for helping me develop my understanding of the whole uh, industry and, and let me say uh, on the broader picture of things I think that we need to dramatically increase the amount of government investment in uh, film and in the arts generally, uh, given the enormous potential it, it has for employment, uh, to just develop the reputation of the country and at all sorts of uh, levels. And I think it has been the poor relation essentially of government spending for a long time. So uh, uh, that's just a general comment. I'm on the side of people who want to develop the film industry and I recognise the potential. However, uh, I have to say that I'm deeply concerned about some of the things that I have uh, heard today and that I've learned uh, over uh, recent times, and I particularly want to acknowledge the Irish Film Workers Association here who've acquainted with me with their experience, uh, who I believe are coming in here in a couple of weeks' uh, time. And what they paint is not a very pleasant picture. Um, first of all, they point out that an awful lot of money is going in the tax break, the Section 481. I think, and you can tell me if I've got these figures right, and I may make silly mistakes here, but uh, is it correct that in 2016, 258 million would have been given out in tax expenditures? Uh, that's not correct. That's correct. What, what sort of figure are we looking at annually? If it's section four, you, you, it made the cost to the state is what you're talking about. Yeah, the tax expenditures. Yes. Yeah. It's about sixty or seventy million. Sixty or seventy million. Okay. Still a lot of money. And then in addition to that, there's grants and loans. Is that correct? Irish Film Board funding re represents approximately ten million, ten to twelve million euro. So eighty million, in, roughly. Uh, and that's grants and loans, is it? Uh, you get loans as well as grants. There is a, a, a um, the way in which f uh, film production is funded, and th this is common throughout the European Union and elsewhere. Uh, film agencies provide funding through what are called limited recourse loans, uh, so that uh, if the film makes money, uh, money is repaid to the uh, the agency. Um, that's a practice throughout Europe and elsewhere. Okay. Well, I, I want to ask about that in a minute, but th that's uh, that's 80, 80 million. So it's a lot of money. How many people are permanently, directly employed by the production companies? Permanently employed. How many? Given that there's 80 million euro going in, I believe. Again, if I understand the thing, a relatively small group of production companies, the parent companies, are the main beneficiaries of most of that money. I know there's a lot of companies and small ones and so on, but. I understand that there's, a, you know, maybe 10 or 15 parent companies who probably get the bulk of those expenditures, both direct and tax. Devin, the, no, the benefit of the uh, funding goes to the vast number of people who are working in the sector. Uh, the figure I gave for the total number of people, full-time equivalents in the sector was 17,000. Not full-time equivalents, people who are permanently employed by the production companies who are the people who get the, who, who apply for the tax, section 481 I presume, because it's not the crew who apply for it, it's the companies, isn't it? But the money is used to pay the crew. No, but it's the companies who, who apply, who get the certificate for 481, or get the funding, is it not? Yeah, but then they receive it and pay it to the crew. Okay, but how many, those companies who receive that, how many people do they permanently, directly employ? It's, as, as I think, going back to the description of the sector which I gave in my presentation, the sector is made up of a very complex set of skills across a wide range of activities. So there are writers, directors, actors, cinematographers, construction crew, costume designers. So the sector is made up of a very wide range of very different people. I, I fully understand that, okay, and actors, and I should make just a point uh, on actors and get a comment from equity on this, but I mean, I think some of my comments are probably less focused on them, and because I think with, with actors, frankly, the state should ensure, mm -hmm. uh, uh, should recognise that they're not just jo normal job seekers in between jobs, mm -hmm. right, and uh, that after a period where it's acknowledged somebody is a professional actor, the state should ensure a decent living for them mm -hmm. and some sort of arrangement where they are employed by the state 
or given a, a, a decent level of income so that they don't have this precarious existence. So I'll just say that as a, a by the way, right, and maybe get equity to respond to that point, but I'm talking about the people who make the props, who do the transport, who uh, build the sets, uh, very, very skilled people, okay, uh, who have absolutely no continuity of employment at all. Now, I, I'm asking, did, uh, do the production companies that get these uh, tax breaks and these uh, grants and loans and so on, how many of those people do they directly employ? I don't have the exact number of production companies per se right now, but we could get that for you. But just to explain the process, and maybe David can help with this as well. If a company applies for Section 481 re tax relief, it's for the purpose of a project. So you could look at um, um, a set of a, an audit or an application that goes in, and every single line of the funding that is sought is allocated for all kinds of activities. An element would be for the production company, but absolutely every single line is for all of those people that James just talked about. So, you know, what a typical uh, application looks like includes everything that you've just spoken about. So there are lots of companies, some are two-person operations, others are bigger, and every application, every company that's set up and applies is for a particular film, a production of some kind, some small, medium, and some large. So I don't know, David, you can augment that. Yes, I mean, it's, it's not just for the tax break, it's the same if you're applying for funding from the film board. And so let's say you have a project that's costing, I don't know, one and a half million euro. Let's say it's costing that. You're probably going to be employing 40 people full time for between two and three months. You're probably going to be employing 10 to 15 people part time for maybe six months. You might be, be employing between 20 and 40 or maybe 50 actors of varying level of, uh, of renown or notoriety, perhaps, uh, over that period of time. Uh, the amount of money you'd be getting from the state for that might in total be a third of the budget, maybe slightly more than that. You as a producer have to go out and raise the rest from other sources in internationally. Hopefully it'll all like arrive in at the same time. That's the volatile nature of this business. Mm -hmm. So basically what the, the top company is, let's be clear about this in case there's any other implication here. What the top company is, it's the custodian of those funds. It's the custodian. And it has a duty of care to spend that money as it has promised its various stakeholders, and that is its main duty. And if that company, let's be very clear about this too, if that company does not spend its money in the way that it promised, the first thing that will happen is the, the market will turn against it. The second thing too is that its Irish stakeholders will turn against it, will turn against it. Uh, Etc. Etc. So, a company that was to behave like that wouldn't be very long in business, in my view. So, I think that's the. There's a line, uh, and I'm a producer. You know, my line is in dreams begin responsibilities. Somebody comes to me with an idea. I say yes. I'll help you make that. I then have to take responsibility for that dream. I don't mean to cut, cut across you, so I'm no, going to run out thought, of time. I just thought you just wanted... No, I do want a, an answer. A, and a, a just, coherent answer, which uh, uh, is that we are the custodian of that money. With the clearly set rules of what's with eligible and ineligible, so it's, I, 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 it's transparent. <clears throat> okay, well, it's not transparent to me, but that's because I don't know enough about the industry. I'd be happy we to come and talk to us. Sure, <laughs> but, absolutely happy but to do the, that. The picture I'm getting from people Directly. working in the industry is not a good is not a good one. Okay, and the picture I'm getting is that the requirement under Section 481 for quote quality of employment and training opportunities that that's not actually the case. Now we've had an acknowledgement, frankly, and I don't know how it went on so long, given that this Section 481 is in, in place for quite a long time and quite a lot of money has been dispensed that we have. A situation where somebody could, for example, as I met recently, be a trainee for 12 years, 
Right now, just, just bear with me, okay? That's not acceptable, okay? So somebody, I'm not saying everybody, but that's an abuse of the category of trainee if somebody can be a trainee for 12 years. Okay, that's the first point I want to make. Uh, quality employment, to my mind, cannot be defined as a hireman and fire and workforce where at the end of every production, regardless of how long they've worked in the industry, how many different productions they work, what their level of skills are, that actually there's no obligation whatsoever to take somebody back when the next production starts up if, for example, that person has been kicking up about health and safety issues, uh, about pay issues or conditions on, on the set, and if there's no obligation. Uh, and there, there are allegations that's happening. I don't know how widespread it is, but I don't believe there's any smoke without fire. Uh, you know, and you will no doubt say the industry generally isn't like that, and maybe that's true, but I'm, I'm simply saying if those allegations are being made, I don't believe that they're uh, totally um, made up. Could I respond? Yeah. Um, because you've, you've referenced um, the IFA group here today, and we read your exchange last week in the Oireachtas, and can I just say, Deputy, that you're right, I am going to say that what you put forward does not reflect the industry as we see it. That's the first thing. Um, the second thing, anybody training for that amount of time, I'm unaware of that, but would like to know about it. The third thing is, please come and speak with us. We'd be delighted to give you other views. And finally, um, if we're asked to meet with Screen Producers Ireland to express their concerns about a number of issues, we opened an invitation and they've turned us down on both occasions. Our door is open, will continue to be open, and that's the respectful way to get business done, and we'd be delighted to share any other detail with you. That's not the industry that our producers and the group of men and women that work in this industry are experiencing in our view right now. I wanted to respond as well. Yeah, I think that you'll, I, I think that you'll find um, that there are different perspectives on this, right, depending on where you're looking at it from. Uh, and certainly from a union point of view, and I think you'll even pick up on the subtext here, where, where there seems to be a willingness to address the trainee issue. There is a serious problem with trainees in the industry, no doubt about it. You don't know who they are, you don't know where they are, you can't track them, they're going around for years because they get bits and pieces at work, you, they, can't, they can't count up their time to see how long they've been a trainee. Like, if you work if you're working continuously on one production after another, if you're lucky enough to do that for a number of years, you might be in a place to try to kind of get yourself over the line. If you're sporadically on this one and on that one and on the other one, you could end up for years and years and years as a trainee. And sometimes what happens is when work is scarce, it's actually hard for trainees to take up the trainee position because experienced people will be out of work and the production company will say, well, I don't need another prop or whatever, but I, can, but I need a trainee. Do you want to take the trainee position? Position. So you're a qualified person, experienced person, and you end up working for trainee money. So it is a problem. Um, and th with the best will in the world, if we wait around for all of the reports to be finished and for another years and years to get funding for it all, the problem will never be dealt with. Trainees need to be registered. There needs to be a pool of trainees to run through the industry. And collectively, the industry ne needs to decide every year how many trainees it wants out at the other end and pool those then through all of the productions so that we get a, a more professionalised system. Absol but absolutely, there is no doubt about it, there is an issue with trainees in the industry. Yeah, Go ahead. Um, yeah. I mean, obviously, I'll, I'll, and I'll take up uh, any invitations. I do, I do want to know. But, you see, to my mind, there is a problem if an industry gets 80 million euro, and in fact, I'd like it to get 160 million euro, right? I wanted to get more, so don't get me wrong, but I, I, want, I believe that in, in exchange for that, there should be more permanent employment. I mean, I met people the other day who were doing some amazing work in producing props. I mean, it was just blinding work, right? Uh, who were in their 70s mm. and can't retire because of the on-off nature of their employment, they don't have a pension entitlement. Absolutely. That's a scandal. We can answer the pension one, because that's on the table right now in terms of negotiations with SIF2 and a shooting crew agreement. And you're right, we need to come of age in terms of that. Um, so just to be clear, that's, that's under discussion and, and recognised. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, can, I, can I ask another just uh, yeah. Last question, okay. And I mean, obviously we, we'll have some of the other groups in again and we'll discuss this, and I do want to follow it through with everybody here. Uh, um, 
Can I just ask about Ardmore and Troy Studios, right? And uh, is there a conflict of interest between the fact that uh, one person, I should probably not mention names, or I'll be wrapped over the knuckles, but... What? Definitely. Yeah. That one person is, uh, I think, owns a third of Ardmore and is also uh, one of the owners of Troy. Um, studios and uh, that there's something of a conflict of interest there uh, and certainly fears that have been expressed to me about uh, Ardmore being run down or the fear that Ardmore is being run down uh, in favour of Troy. Now I don't see all these studios flourish right but I'm just uh, putting it to you that is there not a problem if uh, the same person has, if you like, the biggest stake in Troy and something of a stake in Ardmore, uh, and there's fears about the future of Ardmore. Um, anybody who wants to answer? Take it in. I mean, first of all, these are two private sector organisations, so their uh, arrangements are very much within the private sector. But the, um, I mean, there's no particular reason why two studios can't be owned by. A, you know, whatever particular arrangements are made. The point here is that both studios are currently busy, active, and being used for production. And that's, I think, the, the, the great, you know, news at the minute. Uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, there are three TV drama series currently being made in Ireland, which is a very significant increase on what was going on in the past. That is, I mean, we, back in 10 years ago, there was one big TV series. There are now three big TV series being, being made in Ireland. That's an extraordinary, a tripling of activity if you put it that way. Three. There's three now, which is one in, one which is actively using Ardmore, one which is <coughs> using Ashford Studios, which is uh, studios in South Wicklow, and the other one using Troy Studios. So there, there are three separate uh, large-scale TV series generating hundreds of employment of jobs in each case for each project. So this is something which I think is the, the good news story. Very brief supplementary. As a matter of curiosity, why, why is, is it Badlands that's up in the old Dublin Sports Hotel? And why it's is Badlands, it? yeah, into the Badlands. Why is it up there? Uh, they had a they, uh, that was a particularly carved out location. Uh, it was a very suitable location for the particular production. It worked out as being exactly what they needed. There is a shortage of studios in Ireland at the moment. Because of the uh, demand for content at the moment, it, we need more studios. Yeah, that's simple as that. Yeah. Uh, my, is that okay? Thank you, Deputy Barrett. 